On the first day of spring, my whole neighborhood is abuzz with parents taking their tiny tykes out to embark on a rite of passage, learning to ride a big kid bike. It makes for some great people watching, and not just because it's funny to see six-year-olds fall down. Watching all the different parents is a certifiable sociological study. One might hover close by, offering their kid a nudge this way and that, and even the first sign of a wobble. While another might hand over bike and helmet and then get right back to planning their grocery list for dinner. Both these kinds of parents have the same end goal, to teach their school-age spawn to ride a bike. They just go about it in different ways. And like parents, macroeconomists have different ideas of the best way to take care of the economy all with the same end goal of steadily growing GDP without dramatic recessions or inflation. Now, we know there's no magical, perfect parenting style, no matter what Momstagram wants you to believe, and there's no perfect economic approach either. Whatever economists, policymakers, and central banks do, there's always going to be an opportunity cost. Hi, I'm Matt Sofa, and this is Study Hall Macroeconomics. Some economists and policymakers think it's better to focus on short-run economic health when faced with bumps in the road, encouraging governments to act now to prevent the long, drawn-out harm of high inflation or unemployment. In response to the bad times of the Great Depression, British economist John Maynard Keynes published The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money in 1936. He blamed the Depression on a drop in aggregate demand and pointed out that the government should probably do something about it. A lot of economists over the years have taken the Keynesian perspective, this idea that government intervention is really important to keeping the economy stable and working properly, particularly when it begins tipping into a recession. It's the economist version of jogging alongside your kindergartner, making sure they stay upright and concussion free. But Beyond the general agreement that the government should step in when the people are unemployed, destitute, and huddling in bread lines, there are some specific things the Keynesian perspective assumes to be true. In addition to believing recessions are caused by a drop in demand, Keynesian economists assume that potential GDP is determinable or can be figured out. They think policymakers need to know more or less where we are relative to our potential GDP to know when to deploy the big guns. And by guns, I mean spending on social services and infrastructure projects. They also assume wages and input prices are sticky, which really just means they take a long time to adjust. Have you ever seen the uh, Lord of the Rings trilogy extended cuts? Even longer than that. This means the price of final goods and services can be much higher or lower than wages or inputs, which can have a ton of wacky effects on aggregate demand, short-run aggregate supply, and the entire economy. There are a lot of reasons behind these so-called sticky wages. Firms are reluctant to raise wages in response to higher prices because once bumped up, it's pretty much impossible to bump them back down, even if other prices begin to fall. They'd risk workers walking off the job, plus specific contracts or even entire unions are there to literally guarantee workers are paid at least a certain rate. All of this pretty much locks wages in place. And of course, the longer it takes variables like wages to adjust, the longer it takes the market as a whole, which is why, according to Keynesian economists, it's so important for the government to jump in and nudge the economy back on track when something's off kilter. All this to say, the Keynesians see that waiting out painful recessions is a negative thing, and it's a much better idea for governments to jump in with fiscal and monetary policy to get that aggregate demand back up. It's the economic equivalent of spotting your kid on their brand new two-wheeler. It's a parent's job to keep their kids safe, just like it's the government's job to do the same for us. People in the US really benefited from Keynesian principles in 2020. When COVID-19 lockdowns shook aggregate demand, the US rolled out a ton of new fiscal and monetary policies, including emergency loans for businesses, increased unemployment benefits, and stimulus checks sent straight to households. This helped keep businesses from laying off more workers or closing entirely, and made sure that households had the money to spend on the things they needed, and keep demand up and the economy going. And it worked pretty damn well. 
While people were still dealing with the doom and gloom of a global pandemic, the economy did avoid plunging into a recession as many had feared. But if all this sounds too good to be true, some economists and policymakers believe it is. They argue that immediate government intervention is only concerned with the short run, making sure things are okay now, and doesn't pay enough attention to growing the economy in the long run. Government intervention, particularly big spending projects like the New Deal and pandemic era COVID relief policies, take a lot of money. And the government's gotta get it from somewhere. That could mean raising taxes on citizens, which might lead to people spending less down the road, hurting the long-term health of the economy. The government can also borrow money from its residents or even other countries. Of course, a lot of borrowing and a lot of spending is a recipe for national debt, which can have some pretty big consequences if it gets out of hand. Just look at Greece in the aftermath of 2008. Government borrowing could theoretically also lead to crowding out where fewer people invest in private firms because their money goes to the government instead. This would hurt private firms and stifle future growth. And there's also an argument that government intervention to fix one problem will only lead to another. For example, the Phillips curve posits an inverse relationship between unemployment and inflation in the short run, meaning that prices might hold steady when people are out of work, but inflation will start to creep up the more people have jobs. All this means that while getting more folks employed and paid might be a good way to fight a recession, it can theoretically lead to another economic woe, inflation. So it makes sense that just like there are multiple ways to parent a young, bright-eyed biker tyke, some economists take a totally different approach to government intervention. Economists working from the neoclassical perspective believe that less government intervention is the key to long-run economic health. They're the hands-off parents, standing at a distance as their kids pedal unsteadily down the sidewalk. These folks think Keynes and his friends were looking for an easy way out of economic discomfort without paying enough attention to potential side effects down the road. Neoclassical economists assume deviations from potential GDP are usually short and not too painful because wages and other variables aren't quite as sticky as the Keynesian perspective makes them out to be. So. Even if a recession stings way worse than a scraped knee, that pain is temporary, and soon the economy will adjust and be back on track, zooming down the road, no intervention required. And just like the Keynesians, neoclassical thinkers have a variety of other beliefs that support their general no government in my economy vibe. Importantly, instead of attributing economic fluctuations away from potential GDP to aggregate demand, Neoclassical thinkers blame events like recessions on aggregate supply, something governments can't really do a whole lot about. For example, while not a cause of the Great Depression, agricultural supply disruptions definitely exacerbated the issue. The Dust Bowl, a period of severe drought and dust storms during the 1930s, tanked supply, and there's really no amount of short-run government fiddling that can influence the weather or bring back the topsoil. And like I mentioned, neoclassical economists believe that no matter the shock, fluctuations away from potential GDP are usually pretty temporary. In the eyes of many neoclassical economists, firms have rational expectations, which means they're motivated to adjust wages and input prices in response to other changes, economic or otherwise, as quickly as they can, even if it takes a while. And it's not like they're looking at totally different information than the Keynesians, it's just a different outlook on the same situation. Keynesians will highlight how slowly these factors shift and the economic fallout in the meantime, while neoclassicists point out that they do eventually change on their own if you let them. Finally, many neoclassicists believe that increasing the money supply tends to increase inflation as well without actually boosting real GDP. Neoclassical thinkers are going to point out that flooding households and firms with money to up demand won't ever actually solve a supply side problem and will just lead to inflation down the road. These assumptions mean neoclassicists believe we should focus our efforts on long run economic growth instead. They emphasize building the economy through boosting supply in the long run, increasing potential GDP. And the only way to really up potential GDP is through permanent changes to economic capacity, like shifts in worker productivity or technology. They believe government spending should focus on those kinds of investments instead of trying to ease residents' immediate economic pain. So 
If Keynesian economists are jogging alongside the bike, offering all kinds of little nudges, a neoclassical parent might be in the shop designing new features to make the bike better, safer, and more stable in the long term while their kid pedals pell-mell down the sidewalk outside. And of course, a brand new super safe bike and an ever-expanding potential GDP sound great, but they come at a price and not just the cost of a Paw Patrol bell for the handlebars. In order for residents to benefit from that long run economic improvement, they have to make it to the long run in the first place. Easier said than done if you're in the depths of a recession, unable to feed your family or afford basic necessities while your government looks on. So whether or not the relief of that stimulus check hitting your account outweighed the pain of a $10 box of cereal is a you question. Maybe you'd rather the government took that money and invested in long-run research and technology, or maybe you think it'd be better if they didn't spend it at all and alternatively cut taxes and encouraged investing in private businesses. There's no one right answer. This isn't Star Trek versus Star Wars. There are pros and cons to both of these economic approaches. And for all their differences, Keynesians and neoclassicists maybe aren't actually as separate as they're sometimes made out to be. Deep down, both groups want what will lead to the best economic outcome and the highest real GDP. In the end, pretty much all economists see at least some role for government and central banks to play in otherwise free market-based economies. So actually, there's no such thing as pure free market capitalism in the world. The modern economies of today don't come from any single perspective but are an amalgamation of many ideas from many economic thinkers, all trying to solve the same basic problem, how to make decisions in a world of limited resources and unlimited wants. But while a strengthening economy and growing GDP is a pretty universal economic goal, it's only one way to measure success. Other factors in a successful economy might include lower poverty levels, a more equal distribution of wealth, increased environmental sustainability, or better access to basic human rights like healthcare, education, and housing. And like how a parent teaching their kid to become an award-winning ice skater, professional plate spinner, or beloved YouTube host is gonna go about things pretty differently than if their goal is to get them up on two wheels, these other economic goals would require yet another approach to how our economy functions. Unfortunately, there is no such thing as a perfect economic system. Just like there's probably no such thing as a six-year-old who's never skinned a knee or two. But the important thing is to keep getting back onto that economic bicycle, trying new things, asking questions, and thinking about an economic future that benefits us all. If you've enjoyed this series and are interested in taking the full study hall macroeconomics course and earning college credit from ASU, check out gostudyhall.com or click on the button to learn more. And if you want to help us out, give this video a like. Tell us your favorite macroeconomics concept in the comments. Smash that subscribe button. Thanks for watching. See you when I see you.